Yes. So turning to knowledge of risk of AIDS, there is little uh, contemporaneous documentation, but I think probably no contemporaneous documentation, to tell us about Dr. Delamore's and Dr. Wensley's actual own risks, uh, own views of the risks of AIDS transmission um, in the years prior to 1985. But we know that they attended key meetings. Uh, so they attended the reference centre director meetings. Dr. Wensley was present at the 6th of September 82 reference centre director meeting. He was present at the 14th of February 83 reference centre director meeting when Dr. Krask made a m much more detailed presentation of the information he gathered. And we've looked at uh, versions of Dr. Krask's reports. Mm. And Dr. Wensley attended the 24th of January 83 meeting with Immuno at the London Airport Hotel. So he can be taken to have been aware of the reports from MMWR, the reports of the San Francisco baby and the other transfusion, transfusion cases um, by that time, if not earlier. Um, in terms of uh, uh, um, local meetings, there's very little, as in local to the Manchester region, um, from 83 or 84. Uh, we looked this morning at the February 1983 meeting, which was regarding supplies and shortages and, and distribution arrangements, where there was a passing reference, you'll recall, at the end of the, the meeting to AIDS um, and no specific action to be taken at present. There's no evidence to show any particular change in treatment policy in response to the risk of AIDS thereafter um, until we get to heat treatment in 1985 other than that reference in the abstract that we looked at before lunch to the use of high HC for um, surgery um, um, in, in, in uh, individual cases. Um, we know Dr. Delamore attended the special reference centre directors meeting in May of 1983, um, uh, uh, and which resulted in the June 1983 letter sent out to haemophilia centre directors. He also attended the October 83 Haemophilia Centre Directors Meeting. That's the one in which Dr. Chisholm made her suggestion about um, a reversion to cryoprecipitate. Uh, there's no, um, uh, uh, no, no record of him expressing any particular views at those meetings. And Dr. Delamore and Dr. Gunson attended the 10th of December 1984 Elstree um, uh, Reference Centre Directors Meeting. So th there's no doubt that between them, Dr. Wensley and Dr. Delamore were involved at the highest level of, of UK HCDA reference centre consideration and decision making in the course of uh, 82 through to 84. There is a letter at BAYP 5027 underscore 074 from November 1983. Um, from a cutter representative. So the date is the 23rd of November. It's addressed to Dr. Wensley. Um, it, it's from um, a sales manager. Uh, and he refers to a meeting. I'm writing to confirm the pricing details we discussed and to provide further information on the various coate batches. I also enclose a copy of the May edition of Echo magazine, which was devoted entirely to AIDS. You will see that it contains a complete list of all the plasma donor centers from which our plasma is sourced. And you'll, now, you'll note that there are no centres in San Francisco or New York. Um, so there in November 1983 is a pharmaceutical representative, uh, it would seem, trying to persuade Dr. Wensley that in terms of the risks of transmission of AIDS, that the, the uh, COAT um, should be regarded as being safe. Um, we do have in um, Dr. Gunson's litigation statement um, Dr. Gunson's own account of, of his developing knowledge of AIDS, and of course, <coughs> he worked closely with Dr. Wensley at the Regional Transfusion Centre. If we go back to his statement, it's NHBT 0020196 underscore 001. And it's, sorry, forgive me for a moment, Schumach. Try page 18. That's it. Um, 
so you'll see the way in which Dr. Gunson um, puts it at various points of his commentary on the uh, plaintiff's statement of claim in the litigation. So here he says, during 1982, it was not in my view proven conclusively that factor eight concentrates were the cause of AIDS contracted by haemophiliacs. And then he quotes a later presentation um, um, by Dr. Peter Jones. Um, so the terminology there, proven conclusively, obviously raises the question of whether that was the right, the right question to ask. If we go to the next page, oh, sorry, just further down from that paragraph, he says, the first case of transfusion-associated AIDS was reported in 1983 in an infant transfused in December 1982, and this will be referred to later in the statement, so that's the San Francisco um, baby case. Just, just uh, if you go back a moment to... Uh that's it. Um, the, the reference uh, there to what Peter Jones had to say re refers to uh, the uh, M MWR, which is written by the Centre for Disease Control, um, reporting the infections in three men with haemophilia. Um, and it says the possibility of a viral etiology was thought less likely than an immune response the constant barrage of extraneous denatured protein involved in, in treatment. Um, that's not actually, is it, what the, or have I got this wrong, what the MMWR actually said? No, I, I, I read that as him saying that's what Dr. Jones was saying. Well, um, but it, it appears to be a, a quote um, which attributes it to the or could be read as attributing it to the Centre for Diseases Control, because they seemed to be, in my understanding, quite clear that they thought it was more likely to be viral. Yes. 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 Uh, we'll, we'll check what we have from Dr. Jones in terms of um, what, what Dr. Jones was saying, where this quote is taken from, before we um, do the presentation on Newcastle and Dr. Jones in a couple of weeks' time, sir. Please. Uh, if we go to the next page, Shomik... second half of the page um, again we see the language of proof during 1982 the correlation between the transfusion of blood and blood products was not proven nor was it known at the time that a virus caused AIDS although investigations were being undertaken in this regard and then he says this the first proven case of transfusion transmitted AIDS was reported in 1983 in an infant given a transfusion of blood and products in December 1982 well, it was actually reported on the 10th of December 1982. It was it, in the MMWRs. Yeah, but not, not, not until... Uh, 83 is obviously a reference, I think, to the, the Lancet. Uh, yes, in April uh, of 83. Um, 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 but, of course, it was, it was discussed um, at, an, at a sequence of meetings in early 1983. Um, uh, hmm. I can't recall, without checking whether Dr Gunson was present at those, but certainly either Dr Wensley or Dr Delamore was in, including Dr Wensley at the, at the immuno meeting on the 24th of January. Um, and then he refers to um, the leaflet, um, the regional transfusion director leaflet. Now, of course, we've, we've looked at that at, at earlier stages of inquiry hearings. That's the leaflet prepared in the middle of 1983, which would advise donors in answer to the question um, about the transmission of AIDS, to does, uh, uh, the, in terms of the association, does, does blood cause AIDS, blood transfusion cause AIDS, or is it transmitted by, AIDS, by blood? Almost certainly yes, was the answer in that leaflet in the middle of 1983. Um, and given Dr. Wensley's close involvement with the Regional Transfusion, Blood Transfusion Service, it, it may be that you may wish to infer that he would have known about the production of that leaflet and its contents. I, I know this may not be part of your presentation at the moment, but um, Dr. Gunson was concerned with the blood service. So too, uh, for most of his time, certainly at this stage, was Dr. Wensley. Um, one would have thought uh, that the blood transfusion service in the UK would have kept a fairly close eye um, and contact with um, other organizations in significant countries abroad, such as the United States uh, and the American Association of Blood Banks, for instance. Um, if that's right, then there was a source of knowledge, or at least of uh, view, opinion, there. Because I, I think it was in December of, of 80, 
two, that the American Association of Blood Banks was actually uh, advising its members that it was most likely to be a virus. Yes, I, I'd have to check the date, sir. But I'm, well, I, 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 I have a note. Right. I have a note of this. It's it's a note which comes from it comes from the Creva report, so it, it, it may be a secondary source. Um, but he reported that the chair of the American Association of Blood Banks Committee on Transfusion Transmitted Diseases wrote to its members, emphasising the threat of AIDS in the blood supply, and he wrote, My current best guess is that we're dealing with an infectious agent able to be spread by blood and blood products, and that individuals who receive large quantities of factor concentrate are at an increased risk. So if that was a view expressed in a blood transfusion organisation, not a, a voluntary donor uh, uh, in the same sense as the UK position, but one might have thought it would have crossed the, the Atlantic. Yes. Uh, we'll be looking, obviously, in more detail at, at the role of the blood services and uh, what was and wasn't known and was and wasn't done at, at hearings later in the course of this year. Yes. Shemit, could we go... I think it's eight pages further on. Hmm. That's it. Bottom half of the page. So this is uh, this is Dr. Gunson continued. It says I first became aware of the emergence of HIV/AIDS from the information in the scientific literature from the USA. The first reports were the finding of Kaposi's sarcoma in homosexuals. No one knew what the implications were at that time for the BTS. As the reports began to accumulate, it was clear that the immune deficiency related to this disease was a major problem. The medical staff in the RTC discussed each new development as any department would discuss such major developments in another field. In 1983, he doesn't say when in 1983, but in 1983, as soon as we knew that this virus was transmissible by blood products, we were aware that the disease would have a major impact on the work of the blood transfusion service. And then he says he kept himself informed by reading scientific literature, attending meetings, talking to experts, being a member also of the DHSS expert advisory group on AIDS, although, of course, that wasn't set up at this, uh, until later. We had staff meetings within the RTC. I held seminars and teaching sessions for the scientific and other non-medical staff particularly those working on the blood collection teams. And then he says this, I first suspected the link between haemophiliacs and AIDS during 1982. Sorry, we'll just go down the page. So I first suspected the link between haemophiliacs and AIDS during 1982 when there were instances of haemophiliacs contracting immune deficiency. However, it was not known at that time that AIDS was caused by a virus, and when this was established, it was thought initially that the AIDS virus was not so virulent in haemophiliacs, and only 1% of those who HIV seroconverted would develop AIDS. This, of course, has now been found to be entirely wrong. There were times until the proof that AIDS was a viral infection and that it could be transmitted by blood products. Go to the next page that I doubted the link with haemophiliacs. Other colleagues also had these doubts. He doesn't identify who those colleagues are. Before the emergence of its cause by a transmissible virus, other theories were put forward for the origin of AIDS in homosexuals, e.g. pet pills, nitrates, etc. Until proof was available, so that word again, that blood transfusion could be a cause of AIDS, it was difficult to take specific action within the BTS. From that time, I had no doubts. I held no doubts concerning the significance of blood transfusion in relation to AIDS and acted accordingly. Any literature which I published on this subject has been on the testing of blood donations and the safety of the blood supply. I am sure I was aware of the articles in The Lancet on the 15th, 22nd and 29th of January 1983, since I made a point of keeping up to date with the literature on this subject. So that's what we have from Dr. Gunson on his knowledge. Um, uh, and we know, of course, that there were regular communications and interactions between him and Dr. Wensley, um, given that they were both working within the same regional transfusion service and, uh, and indeed were both jointly involved in arrangements for um, the obtaining of and then the distribution of and use of uh, uh, blood products. Uh, other than that, as I say, w w 
the question of what was known as a matter of fact by, and believed by Dr. Wensley and Dr. Delamore is going to be a matter of inference for you, sir, um, from the available material in both, in both the literature and the various meetings which they both attended. Yes. Uh, uh, what um, it does, uh, Dr. Gunson, at any stage in that document, where he talks a lot of, uh, 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 quite a bit about the um, the knowledge that it was, that is, uh, a virus was the cause of AIDS. Do they ever talk about the, the risk that it might be? No. Well, he talks about suspecting the link. Um, yes. But then elsewhere, his language is couched in terms of what was what was known, that, what was known that things were, as a matter of fact, and what was proven. Um, so the, the, the language that we see, for example, used by Dr. Spence Galbraith in, in his May 1983 communication to the Department of Health, where he's talking about likelihood and may, and then the need to act essentially on a precautionary basis. We don't see an echo of that here, no. Well, it, um, what's made me uh, ask that is, is by reference in particular to the views expressed by Dr. Bevan yesterday, uh, uh, where he was critical, uh, from his perspective, uh, of uh, a view that looked for certainty and proof. Yes. Um, if, if we then look at... NHBT 0096599 underscore 043. Um, and we go to the second page. We can see these are minutes of the Northwest Supra Regional Haemophilia Meeting held on the 7th of May 1985 at the Regional Transfusion Centre in Manchester. We can see attendance amongst others from Dr. Dannemore, Dr. Wensley, Dr. Stevens. We've got Dr. McVerry, for example, um, from Liverpool. We've got uh, Dr. Gunson, Dr. Krask, Dr. Lee from Lancaster, and so on. Um, uh, you'll note, if we just go to further down the page, please, Shamik. Where it says minutes of last meeting, the last meeting had been held in 1980 and minutes for this were not available. So it would appear that on a, a northwestern supra-regional basis, there had been no equivalent meeting for five years. N notwithstanding, of course, all that was happening in that intervening five-year period. There is a discussion, if we look at the second page, under the heading AIDS cases, um, there's a discussion there. Uh, uh, Dr. Krask reports from the Atlanta meeting, talks about three groups of HDLB3 positive patients. Um, uh, and then uh, um, asks to be informed if anyone falls into those categories or, or, or to notify Oxford. Uh, and and counselling of patients is then discussed. Um, also around the time of mid-1985, if we go to SHTM 40711, And if we just zoom in a little closer to that. So this is the Daily Telegraph, 31st of July, 1985. Um, AIDS alert as 400 gets suspect blood. 400 haemophiliacs in northwest England are to be screened for AIDS after fears they could have contracted the disease by being given contaminated blood imported from America. I'll come on to the timing of, of, of the testing of, of, of the patients at the haemophilia centre in, in a few minutes. A Northwest Regional Health Authority spokesman said the tests have been ordered as a precaution, but Dr. Richard Wensley, Director of Haemophilia at Manchester Royal Infirmary, believes on statistical evidence two people may have contracted the disease. Now, the basis for that view being expressed by Dr. Wensley, if this is an accurate newspaper report of, 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 of 
uh, of his belief is unclear, uh, either from this or from any other contemporaneous material. And the, the date of that, you say, is 31st of July, 85? Yes. So it's, it's, uh, it may not be an accurate report, of course, no. um, but it's, it's not clear what the basis for it is or what the reference is to the, to the statistical evidence. Uh, well, and why it was current at that date. Yes. Well, um, uh, uh, um, the, the issue was triggered by um, uh, the, um, I think the, the arrival of the test kits. And if, if we actually just, sorry, just go back to the document we were looking at previously. So NHBT 0096599 underscore 043. NHBT 0096599 underscore 043. And if we go to the second page, so this is the 7th of May minutes from 85 we were looking at a moment ago, the Northwest Super Regional Haemophilia Meeting. If we go to the third page, there was one paragraph I skated over. So under the heading AIDS cases, it's the last paragraph of that section. As one of the six reference centres to have a kit for testing for HTLV3 antibody, tests in Manchester should be available by mid-June. So it appears that there were going to be a, uh, um, tests available actually to the haemophilia centre rather than have necessarily having to send things off to, to Dr. Ted or, or elsewhere. It's not quite clear why. You'll see in a few minutes when we get to the question of testing, the precise time frame over which tests were undertaken on the, the, the patients you know, most, most likely to be at risk remains unclear. Um, but it may be that this is what triggers the newspaper article, which is referring to um, tests having been ordered. Uh, it's uh, particularly surprising because the... At this stage, uh, the, the big debate, uh, I had thought, uh, was about the uh, testing, the screening of, of blood supply for the presence of the virus. Uh, and at this stage, there was, uh, you showed us earlier in your presentation in respect of Cardiff uh, how Professor Bloom was, was writing um, in uh, mid-83 to say, uh, mid-85, I mean, to... Um, uh, to encourage the the authorities to get a move on. Yes, it, 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 it's puzzling because these minutes don't, they don't seem to be referring to the availability of test kits for the regional transfusion centres. They're talking about the availability of test kits for the reference centres, for the yes. testing of haemophilia patients. Uh, and perhaps the intention is because Man uh, this is pure speculation, I should add. Manchester obviously was a very large haemophilia centre um, to enable testing of everybody or testing on a, on, an, on a repeat and ongoing basis, initial tests having perhaps already been undertaken. But it, it's not clear and it is slightly puzzling. Uh, unless, I, I suppose, it, 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 uh, there was some system of, of checking to make sure that the heat treated product actually worked. That, that's possible. Um, but we have no other sign of that, have we? No, there is a reference somewhere in the documents uh, and, and in the documents relating to Manchester to an, an, uh, uh, where patients had tested negative to uh, uh, undertake repeat testing. Yes. Uh, so it, it may be that these are tests that were intended to be utilised for that purpose or for the purpose of offering tests to, to relatives, partners and spouses. Um, but, but it's not clear and and the position is muddied rather than clarified by the, the report in the newspaper of what Dr. Wensley said to believe. Yes, uh, and, and also <laughs> by the fact that the, the report is, is very nearly three months after the meeting. Yes. But um, anyway. Um, the, the only thing we have really authored by Dr. Wensley directly is, is a slightly later letter from 1987, um, which is at MACK... 
40589. He's writing to a um, firm of solicitors in Edinburgh on the 15th of July 1987 about a, a haemophiliac uh, client who contracted AIDS allegedly as a result of treatment at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary. And he says this, perhaps I can reply in general terms about the current situation with regard to the AIDS virus and the haemophiliac. Um, and then he sets out general background. Uh, AIDS first described in 1981 in US haemophiliacs in 1982, cases appearing in UK haemophiliacs since 1983, and then he identifies the high-risk groups. And then he says this, in the UK in 1983, in an attempt to reduce the risks to recipients of blood and blood products, donors who were in the above categories were requested to stop donating their blood. So that's the, 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 the leaflet from mid-1983 produced by the Transfusion Service. It had been realised that blood products, so it had been realised, past tense, um, that blood products such as factor eight freeze-dried concentrates probably carried more risk of containing the suspected infectious agent, especially if they were imported from the USA, than single donation products such as cryoprecipitate or frozen plasma. However, the latter products are more appropriate for the mildly affected haemophiliac and are in general unsuitable for self-administration by the severely affected uh, haemophiliac. Um, it, it, it may be that, couched as it is in those terms, it may suggest that Dr. Wensley had, had not reverted to cryoprecipitate for severely infected haemophiliacs, although that's a matter of inference rather than what's set out in terms. Um, uh, and then um, he, uh, he goes on to talk about the further investigations that might be uh, required in relation to the individual uh, patient. Um, but that's, it, it, it would appear that he's saying there that it had been realised in 1983 or by 1983 that blood products probably carried more risk um, than single donor products. Yes. Uh, there's then a document. Excuse me for a moment while I find the reference. At WITN four seven one five zero zero two. Go to the second page. This is on a, on a, a slightly different topic, but it m may assist in uh, w when you consider what response could or should have been made to the AIDS crisis. So, um, this is Dr. Wensley writing in June of 1988, and if um, we, he's talking about a problem in which the world supply of factor eight has dried up. And so there's a shortage of, 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 of factor eight. And if we go further down the page, please, Shamik, he says this, how will we in the Northwest weather the crisis? Uh, and then he talks about the, the hope that um, uh, the, in the Northwest they'll be self-sufficient. Uh, and then he says this, we hope that we will have enough freeze-dried factor eight available to continue home treatment in 1988 for all patients who treat themselves. But a temporary reversion to cryoprecipitate use for certain home treatment patients has to be considered a possibility. A handful of non-emergency operations may have to be postponed and carried over to 1989. So you'll see, sir, that in 1988, in response to a, a, a worldwide shortage of factor eight, Dr. Wensley's contemplating a temporary reversion to cryoprecipitate for home treatment uh, and th the deferral of, of non-emergency operations. Uh, and that may give rise to the question of if, if that's a step that can be taken in response to shortage in 1988, are those steps that could have been taken in response to a, a real risk of infection uh, in the earlier part of the 1980s? Uh, and we should say we've seen no positive evidence, at least, and no evidence from uh, 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 
patients um, or, or their families who provided statements to the inquiry that there were offers to revert to cryoprecipitate in the first part of the 1980s in, in response to the AIDS or, or the, the developing risk of AIDS. Uh, in terms of what information was or was not provided to patients about the risks of hepatitis uh, and uh, or uh, HIV AIDS, the thrust of the evidence which the inquiry has received in both written and oral form from patients and their families is to the effect that they were not informed of risks of infection before um, being treated. We've given a handful exam of examples of, in the written notes, but you saw, uh, uh, I know, uh, uh, reading and considering in each and every statement that the inquiry receives. Um, there is, um, if we look at NHBT 0016480, Um, this is Regional Transfusion Directors meeting of January of 1976. Uh, and in, insofar as Manchester is concerned, I think it's Dr. Stratton who was the Regional Transfusion Director at that time, rather than Dr. Gunson who was still at Oxford, and Dr. Stratton was in attendance. Um, uh, if we go to page 7, please, Shamek. It's just interesting to note, it says under the heading provision of plasma, bottom part of the page, the situation in certain RTCs was, and then if we go to Manchester, fewer requests received for haemophil since World in Action TB programme. So it's the very last um, line of the page. It, it's one of very few contemporaneous references in, in any of the minutes or other documents that we've seen to the World in Action programme. W whether that's fewer requests from patients who are concerned and worried having seen it, um, or, or it represents views of clinicians is, is unclear. It, it's being reported to this meeting by the um, Regional Transfusion Director. And there is, if we move forward a number of years to December of 1984, there is a, um, one document which suggests information being provided um, to patients or to a patient um, about the risks of hepatitis. That's at WITN 354002. Go to the second page. Um, we, we, you can see with the, the left hand side of the letter is slightly cut off, so we don't get the complete sense of it. But it's 27th of December 1984, um, and it's from the Haemophilia Centre in Manchester uh, to a patient. Um, you're probably aware that treatment of your haemophilia, a carrier state, um, should you require surgery or meet with an accident, can carry a risk of giving you jaundice, technical name, hepatitis. Several different viruses can cause this complication of treatment with hepatitis B and hepatitis non-A, non-B are the main types in haemophiliacs. Um, hepatitis group of diseases usually takes the form of a short or, I don't know what that word is going to be, long-lasting, unpleasant, but very seldom fatal episode. So that's the acute stage. These symptoms usually pass off completely in a few weeks and normal health is regained. And then it says, um, one important feature of hepatitis is that in a proportion of cases, it, and probably the word can is missing, uh, or, may. or may, go on to a chronic disease of the liver, which may lead to symptoms in, and, and perhaps the word that's missing is later. Um, and then there's a reference to eradication of hepatitis B and to immunization um, with the... Uh, uh, hepatitis B vaccine. Um, whether that was sent more generally or whether this was a one-off, we don't know. Uh, but um, we haven't 
currently at least found any trace of any earlier equivalent letter identifying um, um, the risk of chronic disease of the liver as a result of treatment. And we've certainly found no written material um, until we get to 1985 and the letter we're about to turn to a uh, warning of the risks of AIDS. And um, so the letter that we have from 85 uh, from Dr. Wensley is at PMOS 5083. So this is a letter dated the 4th of January of 1985. Um, and the circulation is all adult haemophiliac, so it, it looks like it's a standard letter that was being sent um, uh, to all, all patients of the centre. You'll probably have learnt from television, radio and the newspapers or from the Haemophilia Society that cases of AIDS have occurred in Britain and that two haemophiliacs have died of the disease. In view of the anxiety that these reports can cause, may we bring some facts to your attention. Knowledge of the cause of AIDS has advanced rapidly. It's due to a virus called HTLV3. Recently, it's been shown that many haemophiliacs have been exposed to the virus as a result of receiving large donor pool clotting concentrates. If the virus behaves in the same way in haemophiliacs as in homosexuals or drug addicts, it's expected that most haemophiliacs exposed to the virus will remain well and will eventually become immune to it. A few may develop an illness with fever and gland swellings, which will go away as they become immune, and a very few may develop AIDS. Until the right tests are available, it is probably best to assume that you could be carrying the HGLV3 virus. Um, and then there is a paragraph on the risks of sexual transmission. And then if we go down the page, it said rather over-optimistically this, the longer-term outlook for haemophiliacs as far as AIDS is concerned is encouraging. The virus is quite sensitive to heat, and plans are in hand to introduce heat-treated clotting factors in the near future in the northwest region. It was then an aspiration for there to be an HGLV3 vaccine and synthetic um, factor concentrates. Uh, and then it said, uh, if you have any queries, don't hesitate to contact Mrs. Redding or either of us requesting a further discussion. The reference to either of us, I anticipate, is to Dr. Delamore and Dr. Wensley, whose names are given at the top of the page, and it's a letter from Dr. Wensley. And so that's the first document that we found which is a document sent to patients dealing with the risks of AIDS and of course it's it's January 85 <coughs> um, and then if we look at NHBT 0085185 underscore 001 This is a further communication from Dr. Wensley to a patient. This appears to be to one specific patient who's written um, to the regional transfusion, no, to the regional health authority, rather than a general um, letter for all patients. It says, "I've been asked to reply to a letter you sent to the Northwest Regional Health Authority on the 17th of January, 85." And then he says this, and the date of the letter is 6th of March, 85. It is true that haemophilia A patients in this region will only receive heat-treated factor A concentrates from this time onwards. It's not entirely clear whether the this time is the 17th of January or the this time is the 6th of March. In replying to your second question, you can be sure that the heat-treated factor 8 that you will be issued with for your home treatment will be free of the risk of conveying the HTLB3 AIDS-associated virus. Uh, just um, in, in uh, answer to your uh, you're wondering whether it related to the 17th of January or the 6th of March. Um, unless I'm persuaded otherwise, um, I, I think the natural inference is from the 6th of March. And the reason for that uh, is that the, the second paragraph is expressed in the future tense. Yes. Will only receive from this time onwards, um, not have only received, from the January the 17th. This is, after all, um, six weeks or so later. I, I, I agree, sir. It is the natural inference from the language used. So uh, unless there's some other reason to think that this is a, uh, an early draft which is um, simply being rolled out again uh, casually, um, 
something of that sort. Uh, that's how I will read it. And, and if we look at the third paragraph, you can see an assurance being given that the heat-treated factor eight um, will be, um, that you'll be issued with will be free of the risk of conveying HDLV3 virus. But of course, we know that in both January and March of 1985, the center took delivery of non-heat-treated NHS factor. Now, maybe that wasn't being given out for home treatment, but nonetheless, it was presumably received with the intention of it being used, whether in hospital or at home. Um, so there may be a question as to whether that was a, an assurance that, that could actually be given. Well, it, it, is, it also assumes that the, none of the commercial heat-treated factor concentrate uh, would carry even a small risk yes, of it does. Uh, carrying AIDS, something which, at least in, in the case of one manufacturer, proved uh, illusory. Yes, so that's absolutely right. And, and you're right, it, it's expressed in, in categorical terms, will be free of the risk. Um, and then if we uh, look then, um, and we're still in early 85, um, at a letter from Dr. Wensley to the Department of Health, DHSC 0003830 underscore 020. We can see it's dated the 1st of February 1985, and Dr. Wensley is saying this. As a haemophilia director with a large haemophilia practice at Manchester Royal Infirmary, I'd like clarification of the measures required for dealing with blood samples of patients with haemophilia. My two questions specifically are, and it's the first that's of relevance for our purposes, in the absence of results of anti-HTLV3 tests being available, should I assume that each of my haemophiliacs comes into the categories described, and it's referring there to a particular piece of guidance, um, as patients in whom AIDS or PGL is suspected or has been diagnosed? Um, so that would suggest, and again, it's consistent with other material I think that we've seen, that as at this point in time, um, we don't know for certain whether some tests have been carried out, but certainly it would suggest that the majority of patients in Manchester Royal Infirmary had not yet been tested for HTLV3 which is obviously somewhat later than we've seen for some of the other centres. Uh, the department's response is, is um, uh, to say, to assume that, um, uh, potential infectivity. Uh, in, in terms then of trying to pin down when HTLV3 testing was undertaken, there are a couple of letters to individual patients the first in time that we've identified so far is WITN 3543003. I'll go to the second page. Again, unfortunately, the left-hand side of the letter's cut off. It's dated the 22nd of May, 1983, um, uh, but it appears to be talking, uh, making an offer of AIDS virus antibody testing to all patients with bleeding disorders who've been treated with plasma, then there's words missing, and then concentrated clotting factors since 1980. And there's a recommendation that the, the patient call the haematology department um, uh, uh, um, to make an appointment. And there's a, a letter from September of 1985 which is at DHSC. Uh, I think, um, just for the transcript, uh, you said that was dated the 22nd of May, 83. It is 85. 85, I'm so sorry, yes, 85. Um, and then if we go to DHSC 0013118, Um, this is a letter dated the 2nd of September, 1985. Um, we're now able to offer AIDS virus antibody testing, anti-HTLV3, to all patients with bleeding disorders who've been treated with plasma, cryoprecipitate, or concentrated clotting factor since 1980. So this appears to be the full text, um, but a later, a later letter. I would strongly recommend that we test your blood, suggest you call at the clinical haematology department any day, Monday to Friday, between 9 and 4.30, or by arrangement on a Saturday morning. Um, 
now, uh, that certainly shows that as late as September 1985, testing still appears to have been being offered for the first time to some patients. It may be that testing had already been undertaken for some of the patients earlier in the year, but we've not been able to, to get to the bottom of that. We have been sent, and I'm grateful for it, um, extracts from, for example, UK HCDO records relating to various patients at, at Manchester, um, which provide some earlier dates for samples. Um, but whether that shows, for example, testing at the beginning of 1985, or whether it shows testing on stored samples later on is unclear. There's certainly at least one reference to a first positive um, date from much earlier on in the 1980s, which would suggest that some testing on stored samples was undertaken. Uh, but but it, it's not possible to be clear about that at this stage. Nor do we know um, whether uh, there was any form of pretest test counselling um, uh, or, or, or whether um, there was testing undertaken without knowledge and consent. This obviously is an invitation to some patients to come and be tested with their knowledge. Um, but there is at least some evidence that the inquiry has received from individuals who say that they were tested without their knowledge. Uh, and so the, the picture is, is a mixed and, and somewhat confusing one at present. Uh, uh, to, to who, who was the, the addressee of the, uh, of the letter, this letter, as far as we know? Uh, I'm not asking you to, to say anything about the, what is confidential on, on the copy, but in general terms, in terms of category, because I can understand perhaps uh, why it may be that those who suffered from serious uh, haemophilia A uh, and attended regularly or, or were on home treatment and came in every one or two months to get a fresh supply, why they might have been tested. Uh, and if this letter had been intended to go to everyone, there might have been others who may have had a factor concentrate um, or plasma or cryoprecipitate at some stage in the previous five years. So it may be that this is designed to hoover up the, uh, the less seriously affected. It, it may well be, sir. I, um, I, I, I have a version of this document which shows me the name, but I don't know without undertaking further research whether what uh, category of patient that person was. If it's a round robin letter, there'll be other examples. Yes. Uh, and, uh, but again, it, it's a pity that we don't have uh, any, anybody here to give the explanation or any document that, that provides it. Yes, unfortunately, we don't. Um, in, in terms of patients being given their results, again, the evidence shows a, a, a mixed picture. So, uh, if we go to WITN 2117003, we can see this is a letter dated the 1st of July 1985. We just see the whole letter. We just go slightly down, thank you. It's from Dr. Wensley. Um, this patient with haemophilia A who gives his own treatment, so presumably on home treatment, was reviewed recently in the clinic and he was given the result of his anti-HTLV3 antibody test, which was positive. This means that he's probably carrying the AIDS virus and has perhaps only a one or 2% chance of contracting the disease himself. I hope shortly to arrange a meeting between the general practitioners who like yourself have an HTLV3 antibody positive patient and members of the department who treat haemophilia in the fairly near future. So that's a, that's a test result for someone on home treatment who's most likely to be, one would have thought, someone with severe haemophilia. Can't rule out, of course, that there are other categories, but that seems to be the likeliest. And um, being given their result only in the middle of 1985. Um, and, what, and at what looks like it might have been a, a regular appointment rather than any kind of specially arranged appointment. Although, again, that's a matter perhaps of inference rather than anything else. Um, there are, um, we have examples of, of 
documents of patients being give, informed of negative HTLV3 results by letter um, rather than in person. And the inquiry has received evidence from individuals saying that they were informed of a positive result by letter and without a, a direct follow-up consultation. So again, the picture, picture is, a, a, is a mixed one. In terms of testing for hepatitis C, Dr. Lucas, who's provided a statement to the inquiry, says he doesn't have any specific recollection in relation to hepatitis C testing at um, the Royal Infirmary, but believes it may have started in 1992 and that a staff grade doctor would communicate the results to and counsel patients. You'll recall yesterday's evidence from Dr. Bevan that he regarded it as the responsibility of the consultant to, uh, to undertake the exercise of informing both HTLV3 and hepatitis results to the patient. Professor Hayes' evidence to the inquiry, um, and, and of course he was saying that for the most part this was something he thought had been undertaken before he arrived at Manchester, he said he thought that hepatitis C testing in Manchester began in 1991 and, and that much of it was conducted in 1992. Um, we, again, we have a few examples of, 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 of letters that provide a, a, a little by way of dates, but your, your best evidence, sir, may well be, again, the evidence of individual um, patient witnesses or their family members. Um, if we look at WITN... 3289010. And we go to the next page. So um, we can see that um, this is a letter June 1983. And if we just zoom in on the passage relating to the hepatitis C result, this is a letter to a GP. Your patient is hepatitis C positive by a second generation test probably a chronic carrier of hepatitis C, slight risk of transmission, um, increased risk of long-term liver disease, such as chronic active hepatitis, cirrhosis, or hepatoma. Um, uh, so uh, we've, we've got there evidence clearly that, that testing was still being undertaken um, in relation to hepatitis C in the middle of 1993. Um, and, and you'll recall... Uh, no doubt from some of the oral evidence and the statements you've read, that a number of individuals have given evidence to the inquiry that they were tested for hepatitis C without their knowledge uh, and only informed of the position uh, afterwards. Um, if we, we don't have either, I'm afraid, a perfect picture or a complete picture of how many patients were infected with HIV as a result of their treatment from Manchester Royal Infirmary. If we go to MRCO 40388 underscore 188, we can see this is a review of main UK cohorts of HIV seropositive cases by NHS region slash district and main clinical centres um, undertaken by Dr. Philippa Easterbrook in July 1987, and if we go to page, sorry, I don't have numbered pages. Try page 17. Yes, that's it. So northwestern region. Um, uh, District North Manchester, if you look so at the HIV positive, which is the third column in the table along, and then go down to where it says haemophilia centre, you've got question mark 100 plus positive slash 180 uh, 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 slash 200. Um, Dr. Professor Hayes' evidence... Um, was that his understanding was that 83 Manchester patients were infected with HIV, um, of whom 10 were under the age of 18, and that 186 were exposed to hepatitis C at some time. So perhaps unsurprisingly, given that this was a very large clinic, a very large number of patients infected uh, with both 
HIV and hepatitis C. Uh, in terms of the treatment of patients with HIV, uh, again, sir, your best evidence is likely to be the, the accounts of the patients who were themselves infected as to how they were uh, subsequently uh, treated uh, and what medications and, and other treatments they received. Um, if we go to... BPLL 0002215. And um, we'll go to the second page. This is the programme for a course that was uh, held in January of 1988 at Manchester. And we don't unfortunately have any detail about the contents of the course. Um, uh, but we can see that information was being provided uh, um, as to the present UK situation. That's said to have been by Dr. Peter Jones. Um, there's said to have been a presentation by Dr. Gunson, How Safe of Blood and Blood Products, Dr. Pinching um, on new approaches to therapy. Uh, and then under the chairmanship of Professor Bloom in the afternoon, uh, a session on counselling the patient the sexual partner, the child and his parents by respectively Dr. Kernoff, Dr. Morgan and Dr. Evans. Dr. Evans was the Manchester Children's Hospital. Um, and a discussion of insurance and psychosocial and psychiatric implications of HIV infection by Dr. Catalan, who I think was based in Oxford. Um, and then if we go to the next page, we can see reference there to the AIDS Treatment Centre um, as a topic. Um, and, and then a closing session entitled An Uncertain Future. Um, it's unfortunate, perhaps, that we, we don't have more detail as to what actually was being said, in particular about psychosocial and psychiatric implications. Um, uh, we've seen some evidence of the treatment of HIV-positive patients being shared between the Manchester Centre and, and other regional centres. So there are, for example, interactions between Dr Newsom at Blackburn and Dr Wensley in relation to an HIV-positive patient and their symptoms and their treatment. Um, at the extent to which there was specialist treatment rather than haemophilia centred or haematologists acting, as Dr Bevan put it in his statement, as ad hoc uh, HIV specialists is, is unclear from the documentation. Uh, and we certainly see um, when Dr. Lucas took over uh, uh, in 1992 and 1993, uh, he is writing in relation to obtaining funding for HIV drugs and talking in brief terms about the treatment policy with respect to AZT in a way which suggests that was certainly something in which the haematologists had um, substantial involvement. In, in relation to the treatment and care of patients with hepatitis, from, from December 94 onwards, we've got the evidence of Professor Hay, which I won't repeat. Um, and, of course, we have the evidence of the multiple patients treated um, 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 or, or diagnosed with hepatitis C at Manchester. Um, there is... Uh, um, well, I think perhaps we'll go to the letter. If we go to an October 1990 letter... reference um, WITN 1577008 and we go to the next page so we'll see there again this is in relation to an individual patient this is October 1990 it is a letter from Dr Wensley although um, uh, the signature for some reason appears at the top rather than the bottom of the letter. It refers to a referral to Dr. Warns in connection with the chronic liver problem and the possibility of participating in a study of interferon that Dr. Warns uh, was uh, carrying out. Um, uh, and uh, uh, there is 
a, a detailed letter, I won't take you to it, setting out the outcome of the referral. So it would appear that there is um, a hepatology involvement to some extent at least. Um, if we, oh, so Dr. Lucas's statement to the inquiry was to the effect that patients with hepatitis C who showed a deterioration in liver function or developed features of chronic liver disease would be referred to a hepatologist. Um, it does appear that there may have been funding issues in relation to the treatment of haemophiliacs with hepatitis C in the Manchester area. So if we go to DHSC 302545 underscore 070. Uh, we have a letter from Dr. Lucas to the Chief Medical Officer of the Northwest Regional Health Authority in September of 93. Um, chronic hepatitis C infection and haemophiliacs. I thought I should write to you to flag out a health issue which relates to the past treatment of haemophilia. This is a potential litigation issue and almost inevitably the treatment involved is expensive. As a result of treatment with non-heat-treated blood products prior to 1985, many haemophiliacs developed clinical jaundice or deranged liver function tests not associated with serological evidence of hepatitis A or B, non-A, non-B hepatitis. Recent technological advances have identified a new virus, hepatitis C, for which serological screening tests are available. We've been screening our haemophilia population. I can give you a breakdown of our results so far. Um, and you can see they're set out 113 out of 162 of hepatitis C positive patients. Um, and then sets out the number who have deranged liver function tests and the number who are also HIV positive. It's 48 is at that stage. If we go over the page, he says this, to summarize the problem, therefore, approximately 70% of haemophiliacs are hepatitis C antibody positive as a result of hepatitis C infection transmitted by blood products before 1985. Um, and then he refers to a third having deranged liver function, and he mentions one patient having received a liver transplant and two others, both HIV positive, uh, dying of liver failure. There's genuine uncertainty about the natural history of hepatitis C infection and its best management. Talks about long-term studies. Um, the probability of developing clinical liver failure among those who survive for 15 years after hepatitis C infection is about 20%. The experience of colleagues and my own experience suggests that this risk is considerably higher where there is concomitant HIV infection. There's considerable uncertainty about the best management of patients with hepatitis C infection. Um, and then he talks about a, a, an editorial uh, advocating um, interferon. And then says this, this editorial, however, makes it clear that the long-term benefits of such treatment with alpha interferon remains unproven. Refers to biopsies prior to treatment with interferon um, and, and the costs associated with that. Uh, uh, and then at the bottom of the page says that from discrete sounding out of the Haemophilia Society, I think it very likely they'll start to campaign in the relatively near future for compensation for hepatitis C infection and also for its active treatment. Over the page, he says, in, in view of this, I feel that it's vital that the problem is actively managed. I would find it extremely valuable if a regional policy or consensus statement could be formulated, enabling me, for example, to approach purchases for the not inconsiderable costs. Um, and in his statement, Dr. Lucas said the purpose of this letter was to make clear his feeling that there was a need for a national or at least regional policy for the management of hepatitis C infection caused by the use of infected blood products. He doesn't recall receiving a response to this, um, and then he ceased to be acting director the following year. Uh, just go, going back to the, uh, the first page, if we, if we may. Uh, and the second page, please. Um, the, the third paragraph there, uh, long-term studies appear to suggest the probability of developing clinical liver failure among those who survive for 15 years is about 20%. So this is talking about uh, chronic uh, hepatitis, which after 15 years creates a one in five risk uh, of clinical liver failure, which is 
very similar um, statistically, I think, to the figures that uh, our own expert group advised us was uh, the case in, in hepatitis C infection, which would suggest that after 40 years, there's 60 percent. And yeah. it's the same, pr if, it's a, if it's pretty much a straight progression uh, after a the first few years, then you, you've got that sort of rate. Um, what is interesting to me is that these, this is being said in September 19, 1993. So yes. anyone being advised of about uh, their uh, uh, their infection in Manchester might have expected to be given to understand that uh, if they'd had passed the six month period and were infected as so far as could be told uh, and, and tested positive that there was this serious growing problem yes yes the the the, the um well, yes, and, and you will wish, no doubt, to consider the evidence both in the form of written statements from individual patients and from their records um, as to uh, um, the extent to which that was information and advice that was provided to them. Um, uh, more generally, uh, on a national s um, stage, you've heard lots of evidence um, that of patients being told it wasn't very much to worry about. Well, that, that's what, what, um, why I draw attention to the particular date. Yes. Uh, and, uh, yes. Um, uh, we also see, if we look at WITN 0010007, and go to the third page of that, Um, this is a letter, November 1993, from Dr. Lucas, um, and I'm just picking it up in the last five lines. It talks about what Dr. Lucas's policy is. My current policy is to observe checking liver function once or twice a year and to consider a referral for some form of treatment, such as interferon therapy, if there should be significant signs of deterioration. Uh, and then he says, in relation to the individual patient, I'd like to see him again in six months' time. Um, so that, that is Dr. Lucas's contemporaneous statement of his policy. Uh, then, so moving to a slightly separate topic, um, the issue of what was recorded on death certificates. There are a couple of documents um, on, on the issue uh, on the issue of inquests. Uh, if we go to HCDO 40441, please. So this is a meeting of UK Regional Haemophilia Centre Directors uh, Committee, September 1991, uh, and we can see that Dr Wensley was present. If we go to page 7, please, shame it, and we go to the bottom of the page... Uh, there's an earlier discussion about um, uh, what should be written on the death certificate. And then at the bottom of the page, Dr. Hay said that there have been some problems with bereaved relatives who were keen that HIV should not be mentioned on the death certificate, even though the death was HIV-related, and he would appreciate guidance about this. Dr. Wensley said that the Manchester coroner wished to know if a death was HIV-related, he was strict on this point, and as a consequence, all of the Manchester cases had autopsies. Um, the press was usually at the inquest, and it was reported in the local papers. Uh, and so that's September 91, and, and there's a brief reference to the same issue the following year, HCDO 40443. Go to page... Just look at the date, first of all. So 10th of February, 1992, the same committee meeting. And if we go to page six. Uh, and we um, zoom in on AIDS and haemophiliacs. 
uh, halfway down that paragraph, Dr. Main asked if an agreed formula of wording for death certificates should be considered. Dr. Lucas said he would welcome the agreed policy. The coroner always wanted an inquest in the Manchester area. Uh, so I draw attention to that because we're seeing, as, as indeed we see from this, a, a, a variable practice a, across, across the, the country. By way of example here in Newcastle, it said HIV never put on the certificate, but they made sure the coroner knew about it. There, um, as I mentioned this morning, um, Dr. Wensley was known to have a particular interest in cryoprecipitate. Uh, and if we just look at, um, yeah, so uh, I would only need to look at the document, but it, by way of example, in, in 1976, he was asked to join a working party to look at the quality of cryoprecipitate prepared at regional transfusion centres, and, and he participated in, in that, and various reports were produced by that working party. If we go to one such report at CBLA 40880, um, this is... Uh, if we go to the second page, we see a report of a working party of the Regional Transfusion Directors Committee, and the members of that include Dr. Gunson and Dr. Wensley. And then if we go two pages further on, <coughs> and we look at the first paragraph on the page, despite the increasing use of lyophilized factor VIII concentrates for the treatment of haemophilia A, Factor VIII and cryoprecipitates prepared from single units of donor plasma still remains an important therapeutic substance. So that's the view being expressed by that committee uh, as at the end of uh, 1978. Um, there is then, if we look at HSOC 0010549, I have looked at this once before, but th this is the minutes of Haemophilia Centre Directors Meeting, November 1978. And if we go to page 13, I think. 13? Yes. Um, there's a discussion about um, the production of cryoprecipitate. Um, uh, and in the second paragraph, <coughs> we see Professor Stewart saying a lot of cryoprecipitate still used in the UK. Directors prefer to use concentrates rather than cryoprecipitate. Wonder what the relevant cost was. Dr. Wensley said it should be possible to make cryoprecipitate averaging 125 units per pack. Um, there were technical problems in making the concentrates. He would suggest the department should wait at the moment before embarking on a policy of turning over entirely to concentrates. And then if we go on the, over to the next page, second paragraph. I think we looked at this with Professor Tudnam. Uh, Professor Tudnam talked about the cost of cryoprecipitate being not dissimilar to the cost of commercial concentrate, and Dr. Wensley here, on the other hand, estimating that the cost of making cryoprecipitate was about one-third of the cost of making concentrates. Uh, and then um, his contribution to that meeting may reflect the, the fact that, that he was closely involved in the Regional Transfusion Centre's actual manufacture of, of cryoprecipitate. Uh, and he's described by Dr. Gunson uh, in a document we looked at earlier, I won't go back to it, as having devised a semi-automated method for producing high-quality cryoprecipitate from which the patient, patients in the region derived considerable benefit. And this appears to be a product developed as between Dr. Wensley and a, um, a commercial organisation um, called the Factor Eta. If we go to, sorry, just find a reference. Um, SBTS four zeros three one zero underscore one five nine. 
This is a letter from a company, Pritchard Laboratory Refrigeration Specialists and Ultra Low Temperature Refrigeration, September 1980. Increased yields of factor eight. It's addressed to Dr. Cash at SMBTS. We take great pleasure introducing the PLR Factor Eta, a unique British product developed in cooperation with Dr. Wensley at the Manchester Blood Transfusion Center. The factor eta will significantly increase the yield of factor eta's cryoprecipitate from mm. human plasma, at the same time eliminating the hazardous and costly methods of production at present in use. Now that, that's the sales pitch for it. But we have Dr. Wensley's description um, at a 1981 symposium, NHBT 0027395, underscore zero zero eight. So we can see the date there, um, 26th of September 1981, a symposium on aspects of blood component production in the regional transfusion center. And if we go to the next page, we see it said, the following information has kindly been given to us by Dr. Wensley from the Biotest Fifth Symposium in Edinburgh. Um, uh, and then we have a, an account of his paper. So halfway down the page, he says this, the use of cryoprecipitate in the treatment of haemophilia A is declining in England and Wales in favor of lyophilized factor eight concentrate. However, cryoprecipitate is the first stage raw material from which lyophilized factor eight is eventually prepared. Improvements in cryoprecipitate factor yield discovered during small-scale manufacture can sometimes be incorporated in practice into the large-scale manufacturing process. Cryoprecipitate is simple and economic to, uh, economical to produce. What is it being used for at present? And then there's a table with indications for cryo. Von Willebrand's mild haemophilia, haemophilia carriers, congenital um, uh, afibrinogenemia, etc., etc. And then source for freeze drying. Freeze dried cryoprecipitate is presently being produced at the Glasgow and Dublin Blood Transfusion Center. Um, what conditions are necessary to obtain the best yield of factor eight clotting activity in cryoprecipitate? And then a number of variables are listed on the next page. And then he says, um, um, the and on underneath that list, in Manchester, we find that the demand for cryoprecipitate is, is decreasing as more haemophiliacs are converted from hospital outpatient cryoprecipitate factor eight therapy and join our home treatment program. This employs lyophilized factor eight concentrate for which the demand continues to rise and there's a reciprocal decline in cryoprecipitate usage. Um, and then he talks about um, uh, cryoprecipitate yields in Manchester cryoprecipitate. And then he goes over the page says, top of the page, cryoprecipitate production employs four essential stages, plasma separation, plasma freezing, thawing of the plasma, and final centrifugation to harvest the cryoprecipitate. We've automated the two middle stages of freezing and thawing of the plasma and have devised an automatic freeze-thaw cabinet, the factor eta. And then he describes that. And then in the fourth paragraph on this page, if we go down a little further, in conclusion, cryoprecipitate can be produced simply and cost-effectively and in its freeze-dried form should be suitable for self-administration in home treatment programs. The yield of cryoprecipitate factor eight from a given amount of starting plasma is about twice that of lyophilized intermediate factor eight concentrate. I believe that countries which are planning for complete self-sufficiency in factor eight supply should consider the advantages of employing cryoprecipitate manufactured by the automated system described above. Um, what happened to the factorator, we've not yet um, got to the bottom of. Um, but um, uh, in terms more generally of the use of cryoprecipitate, and in, in particular Dr. Wensley's views as to the uh, benefit of cryoprecipitate and the ability to produce cryoprecipitate simply and economically, um, uh, that you may find uh, his observations instructive. And so we've included in our note uh, um, some reference to, to Dr. Wensley's involvement in decision-making in relation to the blood services and screening tests. But bearing in mind that we're going to be exploring that in significantly greater detail when we look at the blood services later uh, this year in, in um, hearings yet to be scheduled, um, I'm not proposing to, to deal with that uh, now. Um, we then come uh, as the penultimate topic... I note the time said, but there's actually only a, a short amount further to do, so 
with your indulgent self complete it rather than take a break. Um, again, we've set out in our note under the heading. Um, under the heading um, research, uh, we've set out uh, information gleaned from documentation in relation to Dr. Wenzel's involvement in the involvement of patients in a number of trials and research studies. Uh, I, I, again, I'm not going to go through, the, the, through most of it. Um, it may, however, be um, instructed to look at one document, CBLA, 0001801. And um, so this is a letter the 3rd of February 1984 from Dr. Delamore to Dr. Gunson, trial of NHS heat treated factor 8 concentrate. So um We've heard evidence, obviously, from um, Dr. Winter about his use of heat-treated factor VIII concentrate in advance of 1985. We know that that was undertaken at St. Thomas's, and we've seen evidence, for example, in relation to Sheffield about involvement in trials. Um, and we can see this is trial of an NHS heat-treated factor VIII concentrate. There's clearly been some discussion between Dr. Delamore and Dr. Gunson. It says, I've contacted the Haemophilia Reference Centre directors at Sheffield, Liverpool and Newcastle. I've heard from Liverpool and Newcastle indicating they would be happy to participate in such a trial. I've also heard from Dr Preston at Sheffield saying that in principle he would be very happy to take part, uh, but he's already agreed to take part in a study with Armour and he's not sure he'll have sufficient case material. Um, in order to conduct the study properly and have proper coordination, we should have some further medical help, etc. And he encloses the suggested protocol um, which isn't ultimately a protocol that's, that's, that, that's used. Um, we've um, identified in our notes some further um, communication and correspondence about this trial, um, and the, there are further iterations of a draft protocol for the study. Um, it, it's not entirely clear, however, on the basis of what we've seen so far, um, at the extent to which Manchester patients participated in the study, and if they did, the extent to which that was um, on a fully informed basis. There is also some evidence to suggest uh, that, that a trial of heat-treated chorate was contemplated. So there's a draft protocol, for example, in late 1984, provided by Dr. Wensley to his local ethics committee. So there's clearly some knowledge of heat treatment and, and heat treated product in advance of its introduction in 1985. Um, the, the final topic is in relation to um, pharmaceutical companies um, and interrelations with pharmaceutical companies. And uh, we've, we've looked at some interactions between Spaywood and Cutter in particular uh, and uh, Dr. Wensley uh, and Dr. Delamore already. If we go to BAYP 5025 underscore 062, we can see this is a letter from Dr. Wensley to Cutter dated the 2nd of November 1984. Um, and, and this picks up on the issue of, of heat treated, a, a possible trial of heat treated chorate, but also shows the, the broader interactions that Dr. Wensley um, had with pharmaceutical representatives. Thank you for your recent visit at which we agreed I would put the provisional protocol for the trial of heat treated chorate to the Central District Ethical Committee for their approval. This is now underway. Um, we also discussed my October the 4th letter to you in which I outline proposals for our future experimental work on factor VIII stability and level in heparinized plasma and invited Cutter to give us financial support as our local research fund grant has not been um, renewed. Uh, um, and then he clarifies some points in the letter. While I asked if financial support for two years might be possible, I'd be more than happy to receive support for one year 
possibly with an option on Cutter's part to renew it for a second year, uh, depending upon the results. Um, the direction of our future work's not been settled, but it could certainly be further slanted towards problems of mutual uh, relevance. Um, uh, and then there is uh, um, a, a, a subsequent meeting between the Cutter representative and Dr. Wensley. And then if we go to... Um, BAYP 5024 underscore 086. We can see um, there reference to a meeting taking place um, and then uh, a telephone conversation having taken place regarding the provision of maximum support to work on heparin and factor eight yield. The outcome of the conversation was that Mr. Ted Betham has agreed to the loan of the instrument and free software for 20 procedures and not 20 weeks. So there's, a, um, there's a, an offer of a loan of equipment sought by Dr. Wensley to assist with his research. Um, we've all, already seen, I think, documentation showing Armour sponsorship of that Northwest Super Regional uh, Haemophilia meeting. Um, there were, uh, um, in, in one of the earlier Cutter documents we've looked at, there's a um, Dr. Wensley asking to visit Cutter whilst in um, in the states, whilst in the country for a meeting, uh, and um, there are arrangements or suggestions of arrangements to arrange the hotel and look after you during your stay, um, and we can see a different type of benefit in an, another cutter report at BAYP 608 underscore 189. We can see this is uh, um, May 1986. You go to the third page. Uh, under the heading by a Philharmonic Orchestra, those attending at Manchester, Dr. and Mrs. Wensley, Dr. and Mrs. Evans, Sister Alex Shaw, um, uh, apparently attending a concert organised by, or tickets, sorry, tickets provided by, it would seem, um, by Qatar. Um, so those are some of the interactions between pharmaceutical companies uh, and uh, clinicians at the Manchester Royal Infirmary that we've identified. Um, so if you just give me a moment, because I've, we've been sent during the course of the afternoon by a CP a, a document um, for our attention. And I'm just going to read it, if that's okay. Yes, I'm, I'm grateful. I'm not going to refer to the individual document um, or seek to put it up on screen because it's, n it's not undergone a redaction process, but I think I can refer to the broad thrust of it, and I'm pretty sure we've seen similar documents in, in, in individual evidence. This is a letter, um, a standard form letter from the Royal Manchester Children's Hospital from May of 1985, which refers to having sent blood samples away for testing um, and um, it would indicate that by the end of May 1985, those tests have come back. We'll obviously look further at this when we look at the Manchester Children's Hospital. Um, but it, it may be thought surprising if, if testing facilities were available to the Children's Hospital that weren't available to the Manchester Royal Infirmary. So that, that uh, for present purposes, is, is, is the material I was proposing to show you and those listening in relation to Manchester. But clearly, there remain a lot of gaps. It may be that some of those are filled by the discovery of further documents, but it is, I think, more likely that they are going to be uh, matters of inference for you, sir, um, and, and gaps that may be filled by a, a, a thorough consideration of the evidence of individual patients and their families. Uh, and just underscoring the uh, what you picked up from the uh, the helpful contribution from uh, a core um, co-participant 
uh, what we've been dealing with has been Manchester in the sense of the Manchester Royal Infirmary, although I appreciate that much of your presentation has also dealt with the, the North West in general terms because that's where Manchester is. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> we, we, we are still to, to look at the Children's Hospital um, and the other centres within the North West region, uh, in particular, uh, um, uh, there was material that refers to, to the centres um, under Dr Lee and, and Dr Newsom, uh, 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 and we'll be looking at those in, uh, in some detail, at least, when we do our presentation on all other haemophilia centres that haven't hitherto been covered. Yes. So, uh, Manchester Royal Infirmary, that, that's, that's uh, as far as we we go, um, for now anyway. Yes. Uh, and uh, tomorrow? Tomorrow we have evidence from Dr Shirley. Yes, and we start at 10 o'clock. Yes. So 10 o'clock tomorrow, uh, and uh, that's when we meet again.